The precedent is that only matching applications will be likely to trigger a call for convention. Uh, but Nebraska also has a number of other applications uh, that have either been considered or are on the books. And while some of them are largely moot at this point, they are considered active. You can see the list of those on page eight. Late in the session last year, we discovered the applications from the 60s and beyond. Our application for a convention to consider proportionality in the Electoral College in 1965 seemingly had no end date, so is still technically active, as are the right to life and balanced budget amendment applications from the late 70s. Beginning in 1965, LR9, the so-called Liberty Amendment, was proposed by um, Terry Carpenter, and there was considerable debate and a long hearing, and it ended, up, um, it ended up on the floor but failed to pass. LR 14 in the same year was a convention to discuss apportionment of representation in state legislatures. That was passed um, by the legislature on March 31st, 1965, and was read into the congressional record as our application in, 19, in September 22nd, 1965. LR 42 was our convention, uh, our convention to discuss electoral votes passed by the legislature on August 10, 1965, read into the congressional record May 7, 1966. LR 106 in 1976 was a convention for a balanced budget amendment, um, entered into the congressional record on February 8, 1979. It was passed by the state of Nebraska on February 24, 1976. LR 152 in 1978 was a convention to consider pro-life amendments. It was read into the record, um, on, uh, congressional record on May 2nd, 1978. Um, it cited the 5th and 14th Amendments for reasoning. It was passed by the Nebraska legislature on April 21st, 1978. And most recently, in 2010, LR 538, introduced by Senator Pete Persh, co-signed by Senators Karpashek, Pauls, Price, Sullivan, Jansen, and White, called for a convention to pass a balanced budget amendment. It was basically to recognize um, the 1976 LR 106 resolution was still active. It passed by the state of Nebraska on April 13, 2010 um, with a, uh, on a 39 to one vote um, and eight, eight and O coming out of the government committee. One of the arguments that I've heard in the halls in opposition to LR 35 is related to the fiscal restraint fears um, fears that fiscal restraint would be economically disastrous. And yet I haven't seen any efforts to rescind the balanced budget application that we, among 27 other states, have made over, um, over the years, um, and which several states have passed in the last year or so. Realistically speaking, there's a very real possibility that the balanced budget amendment convention could, could cross the two-thirds threshold before the one that I have proposed, which is identical, by the way, to the resolution and applications which have already been passed in Alabama, Alaska, Georgia, Florida, and Tennessee. In New Mexico, Oklahoma, Missouri, Arizona, Indiana, and Virginia, one of their two houses of the legislature have passed the resolution. And today, this resolution is being debated in one of the houses of, Can of the Kansas legislature, um, and was passed out of committee in the, in the South Dakota House. Some have suggested fears of a so-called runaway convention, and yet there have been dozens of interstate conventions since the country was formed, which provide precedent for how this could work. In each instance, in each, each, each instance states came together with a specific mission or set of missions. They negotiated from a position of equality, with each state being equal in the convention. Perhaps the last major interstate convention One minute. Thank you. happened in the early 20th century, the Colorado River Compact, which created the so-called Law of the River governing the Colorado River Basin. Colleagues believing that there will be a runaway convention defies common sense. Congress has been consistent in not calling conventions without closely matching applications. Those who show up will be there for the purposes stipulated. Two, modern communications, C-SPAN, 24-hour news, Facebook, Twitter, make it extraordinarily unlikely that a rogue element could take over a convention and that no one would know about it until the amendment proposals came out. Even if the virtually impossible did happen, those amendments would still have to be ratified. 
Remember, it takes 75% of the states, even more than our cloture rule, before anything is ratified. And with that, Mr. President, I will, um, uh, I will yield back the remainder of my time. Thank you, Senator Epke. Mr. Clerk? Mr. President, Senator Chambers would move to recommit Legislative Resolution 35 to the Government, Military, and Veterans Affairs Committee. Senator Chambers, you recognize to open on your motion. Thank you. Mr. President, members of the legislature, I'm doing this for a number of reasons, but the main one is to take away from us the necessity to spend all the hours that I'm prepared to take alone in order to kill this lame brain proposal. Senator Epke brought it, but she didn't write it. The language in the thing itself is so inflammatory, so demeaning and insulting, so totally erroneous that nobody with the level of education that Senator Epke has would put something like this before the legislature to try to get the legislature to support it and then send it to Congress, to the head of the Senate, the Speaker of the House, to all the members who are in leadership positions in the rest of the state showing just how dumb Nebraskans are. But I think because I've become the garbage man, I need to have a theme song, and I would take it from Queen. I'm not going to sing it, but it's something like a monotone. Doom, 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 doom. That's another one bites the dust. If you didn't get it, when I read. Article 5 of the U.S. Constitution, I always go to Article 1, Clause Section 9, Clause 1, and Clause 2. You, you talk about amending this Constitution. Let me read to you what Article 5 says toward the bottom, provided that no amendment which may be made prior to the year 1808 shall in any manner affect the first and fourth clauses in the ninth section of the first article, and that no state without the consent, its consent, shall be deprived of its equal suffrage in the Senate. What that says is that the slave trade cannot be touched by amendment. You can amend anything in this Constitution except the trade in my ancestors. And Senator Epke said she was concerned about future generations. I'm sure some of my ancestors brought here on those boats were concerned about people like me. And I'm concerned about the defamation, the degradation, the thingification of my forebears. And this is what Section 9, Clause 1 of the United States Constitution, which is supposed to create a we the people democracy, the migration or importation of such persons as any of the states now existing shall think proper to admit shall not be prohibited by the Congress prior to the year 1808, but a tax or duty may be imposed on such importation not exceeding $10 per each person. What does the fourth clause say? No capitation or other direct tax shall be laid unless in proportion to the census or enumeration herein before directed to be taken. That's to make sure that they could levy that tax on each one of my ancestors who were shipped to this country. And your Constitution said that that provision cannot be touched or amended by Congress or any other method until 1808, 20 years, they guaranteed the importation of my people. But despite the insult, the degradation that was officially sanctioned in this slave-holding white supremacist document, it's the only thing that the descendants of those thingified people have to try to get some modicum of right in this country. So I feel an obligation to defend, to the extent that I can, this Constitution 
from lame brain notions such as this that's before us now. There are some other provisions which are distressing and you're going to have to just allow me to tell you what they are. One has to do with the determination of representation that people would have in the House of Representatives. Whereas there are people in this country who want to say that you might have so-called illegal aliens counted for the purpose of the census, and since they wouldn't go for the white racist Republican Party, they don't like that. But let me show you what was in your Constitution with reference to black people. This is in Article One, Section 2. Representatives and direct taxes shall be apportioned among the several states which may be included within this union according to their respective numbers, which shall be determined by adding to the whole number of free persons, including those bound to service for a term of years and excluding Indians not taxed, three-fifths of all other persons, and three-fifths were black people, people who were used as property would be counted. Three-fifths of that number would be counted to add to the representation of these slaveholders in the Congress. Our numbers, we were slaves, but we were used to give the slaveholders more representation in the House. Our numbers would be counted for that purpose. This is one of the absolute worst, and I will take six hours on general file, I will take four hours on select if it goes there, and I will take two more hours on final reading. I promise you, and all the while I'll stop in between and say, and another one gone, and another one's gone, another one bites the dust, yeah, 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 mm, mm, mm. Another one bites the dust, and I'll feel so good singing it. And maybe after I kill it, I'll say as far as this one is concerned, free at last, free at last. Thank goodness the legislature is free at last, at least of this one. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you, Senator Chambers. Those wishing to speak, Senator Moorfield, Chambers, Garrett, Bowles, Hanson, Epke, and others. Senator Moorfield, if you're recognized. Thank you, Mr. President. Colleagues, I rise in opposition to LR 35 and in support of the recommit motion offered by Senator Chambers. And this is an issue that I have looked at for the last six or seven months since Senator Epke has brought it to my attention. And in fact, I went out to the conference that was in Salt Lake City that was not necessarily dedicated to this specific resolution, but it that convention looked at creating the framework of the rules that would govern a convention. Now, one of the problems with going out to that, that gathering was that many people who were gathered to debate and deliberate the potential rules were there supposedly on authority of their state legislatures and were acting on that authority, when in fact many of them were not. And there was much debate and dissension on what the rules would be and what they would not be governing a convention. Now, the fact that that body lacked the authority to create those rules to begin with, even though we were convened as a deliberative body within the Utah House of Representatives chamber, it brought to light a very important point on why I'm opposed to this convention and opposed to this resolution in particular. That's, there are no rules and there is very little precedent of how one of these conventions would be governed. Article 5 is very, a very short article in our Constitution. It leaves a lot of questions to be answered. And there's one point in my opposition that I want to make sure everybody understands in particular. The last time that we had a limited constitutional convention was 1787 when they were supposed to convene and create a taxing authority for the federal government. Instead, what they do, did was throw out the entire Articles of Confederation and create the Constitution. That was the last time and the only time we had a limited federal constitutional convention. It wasn't so limited. 
And quite frankly, I don't know how many James Madisons and Thomas Jeffersons we have left in the United States to reconvene and do what's right for the country and for democracy as a whole. That is the number one danger with LR35, is yes, it's supposed to be a convention to come up with potential and proposed constitutional resolutions and amendments. That being said, it's being authorized under Article 5 of the Constitution. And if you're authorizing an Article 5 convention, that opens up the door to having amendments. There's no precedent that says you can just simply have a convention and then you have to bring the amendments back to the state. There is absolutely no precedent. I've looked for it, and all I've found is a lot of conservative scholars, legal scholars, and liberal legal scholars that say, this opens the door. There is no guarantee that once you authorize this convention that we will be able to control the scope. And in fact, the only precedent that is out there is the last time that we had a constitutional convention in 1787. And it wasn't limited by any stretch of the imagination. Once we open this door, we will not be able to close it. One minute. Thank you, Mr. President. And once we open the door, everything will be on the table. So maybe we come for a balanced budget amendment, but what are people willing to sacrifice and bargain away to get their balanced budget amendment? Gun rights? Reproductive rights? Religious freedom? Who knows? As we know, just as a deliberative body in here, Sometimes we make compromises. The compromises that come out of a constitutional convention may not be to the liking of many people here. Not only to mention, who's gonna be our delegates? Who are we going to send? Me, Senator Kittner, who are our delegates? That, Senator Chambers? <laughs> there are many unanswered questions with this, and the fact of the matter is, is that all of the problems that this is seeking to address are problems that can be addressed under our normal political system under the current constitutional framework of our current constitution. Time, Senator. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Moorfield. Senator Chambers, you're recognized. Thank you. Mr. President, members of the legislature, now that I have gotten some of those things off my mind and into the record, I had made some allegations about this document which I think ought to establish from reading it. This is the language that I think is inflammatory. The federal government has created a crushing na national debt through improper and imprudent spending. What kind of spending is improper and how do you determine that it's improper? Was it unconstitutional? Did it go for things maybe you didn't agree with? But I think that's highly inflammatory and not sustained by any evidence. Whereas number three, the federal government has invaded the legitimate roles of the, legis of the states through the manipulative process of federal mandates, most of which are unfunded to a great extent. That is not true. I don't see anything that would be a legitimate action by a legislature which the federal government has prohibited. And what is the federal government anyway? Is it Congress? Is it the President? Is it the Supreme Court? Is it that army of federal officials, some appointed, some elected? There's not even a definition of what the federal government is. Then you go on. The federal government has ceased to live under a proper interpretation of the Constitution, interpreted by the Koch brothers, by some of those other Looney Tune people out there who make these blanket allegations without any evidence because they know they're dealing with the kind of people who will support a Donald Trump based on sound and fury signifying nothing but ignorance. And you're going to sign your name to something like this? Fifth, whereas, it is the solemn duty of the states to protect the liberty of our people, particularly for the generations to come. 
generations are coming, you won't take care of the generations here right now who need medical care. You're going to try to talk about making the federal government do something when you will not even make available medical care for children who are here now. It's easy to say future generations because they don't exist. They are not a debt that's due and owing right now. But to take care of our children is a responsibility here and now. But these kind of people always talk about future generations. But if they were alive, when those so-called gen future generations became the here and now generation, they would be as against them as they are right now, the, the existing generation. Then it goes on to say, it is the solemn duty of the states to protect the liberty and so forth. And so they are proposing amendments to the Constitution of the United States through a convention of the states under Article 5 for the purpose of restraining these and related abuses of power. What abuses of power? These simple allegations are simple-minded. You know what an allegation is? It's a charge with no evidence supporting it. Just empty words. And if you would have written something like this, you should be ashamed of yourself. But Senator Epke didn't. But those of you who have read this, if you put your name to this, you're going to tell me and everybody something about you. And sometimes when I've been a bit critical and satirical, at my worst, I've given more credit than you'd be due if you support something like this. And it's not going to happen anyway. It's not going to happen anyway. I probably won't have a chance to speak on this again before the matter is taken to a vote, but I should be able to close. And at that time, we're going to look at the actual text of Article 5 of the US Constitution. Why was that, not that gone into in detail for the record to show that those who are appealing to Article 5 of the US Constitution know what it says and understands? what it says and understands what it says. You're being asked not to take a pig and a poke, but something even worse than that. But I will observe how my colleagues vote, and I'm going to do all I can to kill this nefarious piece of legislation proposed by Time the Koch Senator. brothers and their ilk. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you, Senator Chambers. Senator Garrett, you're recognized. Thank you, Mr. President. I rise in opposition to Senator Chambers' motion to recommit to committee. I'm one of the members of that, that committee, and I support LR35. Uh, I was a skeptic uh, at first with LR35. I was afraid of all the things I think most of us would be afraid of, a runaway convention uh, and other things. Uh, I think the Constitution of the United States is the second greatest document ever in the world, in the history of the world. Number one, of course, being the Bible. But, uh, but I think uh, w w it, there are so many things that, that need to be addressed, that I feel need to be addressed, that I'm not afraid of a convention of the states. Uh, I think it would be great for, uh, for us to take a look at things and just see uh, it's, it's going to be extremely hard to, to get anything passed because of... Uh, all the support requirements, so I'm not afraid of it. I think the dialogue's good. The discussion needs to be had, and uh, with that, I'll yield the rest of my time to Senator Epke if she'd like it. Senator Epke, four minutes. Thank you, Senator Garrett. Um, I'm, I'm sorry that Senator Chambers stepped out. Um, I w he apparently didn't hear when I actually read um, Article 5 of the Constitution. Colleagues, we shouldn't live in fear of the incredibly unlikely. If you don't like the application because you don't believe that states should have the power to call conventions, which are authorized under Article 5 of the Constitution, fine. If you're not in favor of this application because you think there's no problem with this generation leaving a growing debt in excess of $19 trillion to our children and grandchildren without even trying to deal with the continued growth, that's fine. If you think that the people are best served when the federal government tells county commissioners that they can't replace a bridge, 
that feeds the main road that heads into their, hosp their, their county's main hospital, which was damaged in flooding, one that had been there for 50 years unless they spend the money to do an environmental impact study. That's fine. If you think that members of Congress shouldn't be held to the same types of limits on the number of terms that they can serve as we are in this legislature, that's fine. But be honest about it. And be honest about what a convention does. There is no guarantee that one word will come out of a convention. A convention may be held. But you know what? Maybe nothing comes out. Maybe one proposed amendment comes out. If we pass this resolution, we will be the sixth state to call for a convention that would deal with these limited topics that I've discussed. 28 others still need to pass this. No costs will accrue to Nebraska as a result of anything we do with this resolution, at least not until such time as a convention is called and it's decided whether the state will cover the expenses of its commissioners. If we pass this resolution, we, it will be sent to the House and the Senate and be part of the congressional record waiting for more to join it. If we pass this resolution, nothing goes in the statute books, no agencies are created, no, in, no new employees will be hired. If we pass this, we are doing nothing more than doing what the 76th legislature did in 1965 when it passed two applications. We are doing nothing more than the 84th and 85th legislatures did when they passed the right to life amendment in one year and the balanced budget amendment application in another. What we're doing is saying this, hey Congress, add us to the list of states who think we ought to sit down and talk about these things. What we're doing is sending a message that we believe that government could be smaller and more fiscally responsible and needs to live within its boundaries. I look forward to the discussion. I'm sure we will have a long one, one it sounds like. And ultimately, I hope that you'll join me in casting a green vote for this resolution, but a uh, red vote on the recommit motion. Thank you, Senator Epke and Senator Garrett. Senator Bowles, you're recognized. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, as a member of our own budget committee, I appreciate the um, impetus to have a discussion about fiscal restraint. And I appreciate the hard work that Senator Ebke has put into building these conversations across the state and in our communities. And uh, my staff was able to attend some of the informational sessions. So I, I do appreciate the information that we have gotten about this concept, but I'm not fully clear about the process. I understand um, the motivation, but I'm still unclear about the process. And the, the piece that I'm, I'm most concerned about is the process of assigning delegates because on our own budget committee, I think the balance that we have among uh, the representation is really important. We have uh, representation from each of our three caucuses. We have rural, we have urban, we have folks with different life experiences, and I think that really adds to the development of our reasonable balanced budget. But as I read the materials and as I read the hearing transcript, there seems to be a lot of lack of clarity about the delegation process. Um, how would those delegates come, delegates come together? Would the legislature choose? And if the legislature did choose, how would we choose? And would we choose a member of our body or members of our body, or could we even choose citizens? And how do we do that in a fair and reasonable manner? Would we take it to the executive board, which is the way that we, we handle things uh, when we assign people to other committees? So I'm just a little unclear about how that would work because not only is it important that we uh, send appropriate delegates to a conversation like this, uh, I think it would also be important that we would be able to trust them to represent the interests of Nebraska. And that too, I think, is a question. How do we limit the scope and authority of delegates in an appropriate manner? Um, how do we make sure that once there, they do not only reflect the interests of Nebraska, but also stay true to the scope of the call, um, which I think is an important part of the conversation here. Um, Senator Moorfield, I believe you referenced attending a conference about this issue. Would, would you be willing to answer a question? Senator Moorfield, will you yield? Yes. Senator Moorfield, can you provide any clarity for me in the process of assigning and sending delegates uh, to, to the convention? No, the process is not outlined, and there's a lot of questions as to how that would work. Okay. And, and in other states, 
there's not clarity either. It, it, am I right to, to understand that it's not just that Nebraska's uh, LR has been written in, a, in such a way that there isn't clarity, it's, it's that across the country there is not clarity, is that correct? There's no clarity in the LR, which has to be the exact same as the other states. So there's no clarity at all. In fact, some people were saying that maybe Michigan could assign 10 delegates and they'd create a rule where all 10 had to agree unless their vote um, for their vote to actually count, or one state could have one delegate and have the final say. That's, okay, um, thank you, Senator Morfeld. Would Senator Epke yield to a question? Senator Epke, will you yield? Yes, I will. Senator Epke, do you have anything to add to, to help me get clarity around how the delegation process would work? Sure, um, this is a convention of the state's proposal, so the, um, uh, the, the easy answer is that the states will decide individually how they will allocate or how they will send delegates or um, in many cases they're referred to as commissioners. Think of them something as an ambassador. Um, they will be sent with a, um, with a commission or with direction and the assumption is no matter whether we send five or whether we send 15, it will be a one state, one vote kind of situation. Okay, and you know, I guess, I guess not to, to make my Nebraska competitive stripes to show too One much, minute. but, but could, um, could Iowa send more delegates than Nebraska and, and then wouldn't Iowa have more representation in terms of dialogue and democracy? Well, I mean, I suppose they could certainly send more delegates if they so choose, um, but, but they would not have any more voting power Mm -hmm. than we would. So um, it, it, and I think that uh, I have to go back and look at the numbers, but I think at the Constitutional Convention in 1787, there were a few states that sent only one delegate. There were states mm -hmm. that sold, that, that, that sent um, And, and the delegate that we would send, delegate or delegates that we would send, if we sent them with an with the understanding of what we expected as a legislative body and they didn't abide by that, what would happen next? Well, I mean, I think that would be up to us uh, or up to the legislative body to decide. Um, Indiana has introduced a, a, binding, um, a, a binding statute which would give um, any de delegate to a specific Article 5 um, convention instructions, and if they deviated from that um, in, in, in some way, um, then they could be held um, civilly and criminally liable when Time, they return to the state. Thank you, Senator. Thank you, Senator Bowles, Senator Morfield, and Senator Epke. Senator Hansen, you're recognized. Thank you, Mr. President. Colleagues, I rise today in opposition of LR35. If you look at the committee statement, I was one of the three members of the Government, Military, and Veterans Affairs Committee that voted against this coming out of committee. Um, I, and being one of the few people to have already voted against it, I felt it was proper for me to get up and explain my stance. Fundamentally, I have a concern about calling another governmental body essentially out of thin air with a lack of precedent and a lack of clear rules and structure, um, um, as, as even we've heard today, there's confusion in that. Fundamentally, if we feel that Congress is too gridlocked and too partisan to do anything effective, and Congress is doing too much, I don't even know how to characterize it. Congress is doing whatever they do, and it's, and it's not working well, and the American people are not happy about it. Well, that Congress is elected by the American populace. If then the American populace, via citizens petitioning, via their state legislatures, are then choosing another body, another deliberative body, to address the faults of Congress, I have no thought or no notion that that body would be any more cohesive, any less partisan, any less gridlocked. Um, so I think, I think rather than going for a clear solution to a clear problem, we have a messy problem with a messy solution. And I, I don't think that's good governance to, to offer up that huge concession of power without more clarity. Um, I, I'm also of the opinion that I, I really doubt that we can limit the scope of a convention. Um, that came up in testimony. Uh, I, asked, I asked a representative from the, the Convention of States. Um, he referenced agency law, uh, which I, I regret not prompting him more on. Um, 
uh, but it, it wasn't it, by any means a clear answer, and at various points of times, you know, he's talked about there not being a precedent. Um, and then one of the few precedents he talked about, he talked about was state conventions. Um, various states over the years have had constitutional conventions of this measure, and, um, and I, I was just looking for it, but couldn't find it, but I was reading a, a, a congressional report on this issue, and there was a scholar who had summarized state conventions almost always, if they start off limited, grow, and the, the delegates aren't content to discuss their, their limited charter. I think, I think even if we put limits on or we put broad limits on, we, we have a problem. Here we're talking about you know, limiting the power of the federal government. Uh, if that is an acceptable limit and that is something we can go scope a limited, uh, hold a limited convention to, the whole, the whole limiting federal power, I mean, that, that's, that's broad and very open to interpretation. Um, you know, abolishing the EPA might be limiting uh, federal power, and so might be abolishing the Senate. Um, granted, uh, you know, any proposal would then have to have uh, support from the populace, but we're, we're giving this body to really drive the political discussion in our, in our country and our state, probably for uh, years to come, uh, uh, quite a bit of power without knowing who's going to go, who's going to be there, uh, how the power works. Um, so I, I, I still just think there, there are too many questions and too many, too many concerns and, and, uh, so that we need to remain cautious in this area. Um, I would call upon my colleagues, if, if, you, if you think this is a good idea to, to, I guess, send a shot across the bow of Congress to uh, take a symbolic vote on the national debt. Um, One minute. You know, thank you, Mr. President. I, 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 I think that's a worthy notion, but I don't necessarily think this is that vehicle. I think this actually, based on uh, the support and the desire for it, is, is inarguably a, a real call for a real convention. And so if there's anybody on the fence or, an, or, or who, who quite simply isn't taking this seriously or thinks this might be a more symbolic vote, I would urge you to strongly uh, consider that and I would urge you to vote against LR35. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you, Senator Hansen. Those still wishing to speak, Senators Epke, Cook, Friesen, Hilkeman, McAllister, and others. Senator Epke, you recognized? Thank you, Mr. President. I was taken by um, Senator Hansen's comment that this is a messy problem with a messy solution. Um, perhaps it is. Democracy is oftentimes rather messy. Um, I've had a number of constituents who have watched our proceedings over the last few weeks, and they mentioned that with some frequency, that things are awfully messy um, in the Nebraska legislature. Again, um, what we are proposing here is nothing other than what has been proposed by all 50 states in the nation 400 times. Um, it is nothing different than what has been proposed by Nebraska at least seven times in the last hundred years. Um, this is not, you know, a, a crazy notion. It is a constitutional right of the states to request a call for a convention which would consider amendments to the Constitution that could be proposed. If my colleagues are concerned about a runaway convention, let's talk about what the chances of that are. I watched as Senator Moorfeld attended the um, Assembly of State Legislators in, um, in Utah a few months ago. I had intended to go, had a death in the family, and was unable to leave. Senator Moorfeld was given directions by Speaker Hadley that he, had no, um, that, that, that he had no authority to speak on behalf of the Nebraska legislature, which is as it should be. And Senator Moorfeld, to his credit, said, um, you know, re re refrain from voting. Um, and, and I appreciate that. Somehow we think that there are a bunch of rogue folks out there who are going to get directions from the states and then uh, in terms of what they are able to discuss and then, and, and then bolt. Um, and somehow we've forgotten about modern technology. We have 24-hour news, we have C-SPAN, we have Twitter, we have Facebook. Does anybody really think that we're going to check our, our uh, smartphones at the door and that nobody will be tweeting out what's going on in a convention of the states? This will be the biggest thing that's happened in, in, you know, in the last century. 
And so um, I think that there will be plenty of oversight by both the legislators and legislatures who have sent delegates, but also by the citizens. And if there is even a whiff that something bad is going to happen, that there is a rogue element out there, um, don't you think that that will be, that, that that will be um, uh, stopped in pretty short order as states who have sent their, their, uh, their, their ambassadors, if you will, as states decide to call their ambassadors home for failing to do their duty appropriately. I appreciate the fears. You know, I, I taught the American government for nearly 20 years at, at the college level, and um, I always stepped over this method of proposing amendments to the Constitution. I would say, yeah, you know, there's two ways to propose amendments to the Constitution. There's through Congress and there's through the states. Um, but we've never done it through the states because uh, we're always kind of worried about what might come out. Well, you know, um, we might be worried, but, but is, is this the time to take a risk or not? You know, are you worried about the nature of our national debt or not? Do you as state legislators and as citizens believe that the national government has gotten to power or not? I had one gentleman who, uh, who I believe lives in um, uh, Senator McCoy's district who came to one of my town halls and he said, Senator Ebke, I feel like I'm under siege. I'm getting ready to open one a new business and it's been delayed for three weeks until I can fill out a form telling the EPA what kind of light bulbs I'm going to use. That is the case of a federal government gone mad. We can either protect our citizens, our small businesses, and future generations by beginning this conversation, or we can't. Um, I, I'm, I'm glad to see that Senator Chambers has returned. I did read Article 5 of the uh, Constitution a little while ago. Um, and I know that he knows that uh, the 1808 date was put there to prevent any amendments um, to take place before that time dealing with those particular articles that this was not um, some sort of a um, uh, some sort of a slight on any particular group of people. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you, Senator Epke. Senator Cook, you are recognized. Thank you, Mr. President, and good morning, colleagues. I rise in support of the recommit to committee motion by, offered by Senator Chambers this morning and in opposition to LR35. I would like to commend my friend Senator Ebke on the enormous amount of energy and time that she invested in this exercise, but I cannot be in support of legislative resolution 35 as it is currently drafted. Uh, my primary concern as someone who uh, is the descendant of African slaves, as Senator Chambers is also, who were counted as three-fifths of a person, who were owned by a couple of the founders to which Senator Moorfeld made reference, both, both uh, presidents. Madison and Jefferson were slaveholders, as was George Washington. So the idea that this is not, even the initial draft, is not limited to a conversation about the federal debt, and the fact, Senator Ebke, that you just made reference to a constituent issue related to the EPA, is that gonna be part of the mix? I happen to like federal oversight. Do I want to live and die by it? Am I glad I live in Nebraska? Well, kind of mostly. But here's the thing. I'd still be waiting around, or my ancestors would still be waiting around for things like, you know, the Civil Rights Act, Brown versus the Board of Education, Supreme Court decision, the Voting Rights Act, along with uh, my right to vote as a woman, my right to be counted as a human being that's guaranteed to, me, guaranteed to me by the United States Constitution, my right to not be enslaved. Yeah, I'm not surprised that my friend Senator Garrett isn't bothered by this, because he doesn't have these memories of the horrific history of the United States in his DNA, as I do. When I read, and some of these have been, have been touched upon, so I won't repeat them, but when I read 
um, the language of LR35. It also makes reference to uh, founders and future abuses of power. Slight sidetrack here. Many of you happen to know that I have my, my current obsession is Broadway's Hamilton, which tells the story of the founders in a framework of traditional Broadway music, but also in the meter of hip hop. And what it offers is a reminder that the founders, not only were they happen to be European, which meant white, although there's kind of a, a little bit more information about who Hamilton's actual mother was and what her ancestry was, uh, who they were, and I don't know, most, many of you, maybe your families do reach back to European founders who were friends of the king, which is how you got land back then. Maybe I just don't know that about you yet. Were your ancestors friends of the king? And were you here? And were you a land holder? Not many. So that means you're not included either any more than I would be. So when I thought about the future abuses of power, that language, I sat and kind of chuckled to myself, again, remembering this, this show that I'm obsessed with, and thought, wow, I wonder what a, a future abuse of power in the mind of a European friend of the king, One land minute. holder, owner of slaves, probably fathers of other slaves on his plantation or plantations. I wonder what he, because it was always a he, I wonder what he would imagine as a future abuse of power. In his mind, the existence of the state of Nebraska might be a future abuse of power. The fact that we are here, especially me being here, that is a future abuse of power by the federal government. How dare they create Nebraska? How dare they allow a woman to vote, a black woman to vote, a black woman to be on the ballot <laughs> more than once? One that's not kind of secretly black, that's another Matt, that's another five minute speech because there are plenty of folks in history, aren't there, Senator Chambers, that uh, weren't maybe quite viewed as that, but you, that was before Senator Ebke said, that's before Facebook and Twitter and, and the internet where you can kind of get the uh, genetic background on people pretty fast. Time, Senator. So, thank you. Thank Mr. you, President. Senator Cook. Senator Friesen, you recognize? Thank you, Mr. President. This morning we've heard a fair amount of fear-mongering already, and so I'll just add a little bit to that. I have fear. Every year we elect a person or several persons to represent us in Congress. Every six years we elect someone to represent us in the Senate, and each one of those people can vote to change our Constitution. And we send them there with no mandate whatsoever. They do as they wish. If they would get together and have a vote and pass a resolution to change things and with the president signing on, we send them there to do that. They've not been able to get things done like that. And I think now you can see that the anger generated in the country by our representatives at times not listening to us, when you see people supporting Donald Trump for president, you've got to be kidding me that shows the anger that's out there that we have not listened to. That's what scares me. The Article 5 Convention of States doesn't scare me. We send them there with, uh, I think, a limited mandate. But yes, it could head in all kinds of directions because it isn't specific. It doesn't spell out a balanced budget. It just sets some parameters, maybe in the future, that they can stick to in their spending. They're out of control. I'm old enough that it's not going to affect me, but it'll affect my kids and my grandkids who have to pay back that $19 trillion in debt. And I will call it irresponsible spending. You can go through the budget and find billions of dollars of it. They have exceeded anything that we ever expected of them. I, I for one, want them to back off and give the states, we should take back some of the authority that the states should have. 
They have continued their overreach through offering programs and financing. If you don't do the program, you won't get the financing. That's my money they've taken. That's my money they're offering to give back at 10 cents on the dollar. There's another group that came and approached me at about an Article 5 Convention of States. They wanted to address campaign finance reform. I would imagine some of you might jump on board that one. They were Uncle Bernie fans. They thought campaign contributions were buying elections in this country. I think all of you here have seen elections in this body, at least, that someone can be outspent five to one and not win an election. But yes, money helps. It sure doesn't hurt. But when we talk about the different fears that we have of things getting a runaway convention and all those, what we look at in this body, what we address day after day, and our citizens don't demand of us a mandate when they send us here. But I think it's time, with, with the anger that's out in the country and the uncontrolled spending that's happening, I think this is the time that maybe it's time for a convention of states. And history will show that these are very seldom passed by all the states, but they do put pressure on Congress to do something. Because we don't expect Congress to limit their own ability. They can't do it. They won't do it. Asking them to limit their authority is like asking us to limit our authority. It doesn't happen. We just keep taking more and more each year. So when we, I'll be listening more, but so far all I've heard is a lot of what I would call fear-mongering of what this group might do and might not do. But in the end, for 38 states to have to pass this, one minute. that's our final control. I just, I don't see the, the, the need for all the fear. Let's talk about the facts. Let's talk about whether or not the federal government has overreached in the EPA and their regulatory authority. Let's talk about the different spending habits that the government has had in the past and whether or not they're sustainable. So let's have that conversation, but to bring in the fear mongering that's happening, let's not do that. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you, Senator Friesen. Senator Hilkeman, you are recognized. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I'd like to know if, if Senator Epke would answer a couple of questions for me. Senator Epke, will you yield? Certainly. Uh, as I shared with you a little earlier, I had a, I had a coffee and conversation this weekend at uh, my local Hy-Vee, and there were about 25 people here, and this became the center of the conversation about equally split. And I appreciated your opening this morning. I just wanted to, th there were a couple of things you said that I really want some clarification on. And I, and, and uh, initially, as I, I've listened to your, several of your presentations on this, I've always felt that this was something that probably wasn't going to be likely occurring, but, you know, it's, it's, it, it's, it's, uh, it, it's interesting discussion and we kind of go from there. But I have some, some of my constituents are very concerned as, as we've heard some of these today. Did you say to me that, that the, the, the application of 1893 for the direct election of senators, that's still an open application? Um, well, yes, there are a number of applications that are still technically open. However, the 17th Amendment um, was passed by Congress. Um, Congress saw that there were all of these applications for direct, um, for direct election of senators and um, took it upon themselves. So while it's technically an open, con uh, an op open application, it's irrelevant and moot because we already have the 17th Amendment. Okay. So... Uh so what happened to the 1979 balanced budget amendment? It's still sitting there. If you go to the um, uh, balance, I don't know what the website is, balanced budget amendment compact or something like that, um, Nebraska is still listed as an active application. Okay. So then, Senator, I asked the question, if that application is still open, why do we need to send in another application? Because the balanced budget amendment application had very specific language call, w with actual language for a balanced budget amendment. It, it was very precise in terms of the, the, uh, the, the language and what they expected. Um, this is just another effort out there. there uh, if, if you've got the uh, Heartland Institute's um, uh, Article 5 
uh, what do they call it, compendium or something like that last, last fall, um, they listed five or six different Article Five applications that are out there that have um, varying levels of support, the balanced budget amendment, um, Wolf Pack, the Convention of States, there's a um, term limits amendment and, and something else. So then, Senator, if we pass this one, how is that, you, 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 and it said in, in 2010 we did the reaffirmation of the balanced budget amendment. Mm -hmm. Is this going to be a reaffirmation of the reaffirmation of the balanced budget amendment? We are, we, the, 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 this particular um, um, application does not specify a balanced budget amendment. It says imposing fiscal restraints. So there are any number of ways that that could be accomplished. Um, the important thing with this particular application is that rather than getting down to the specific language, um, of an amendment that all of the states would have to agree on, as we saw with the, with, with the, uh, the, the direct election of senators, or else Congress won't call it. Um, what they've done is, what, what, what we've done is agreed upon a set of parameters, um, general subjects that the states may take up in a convention that is called under this application. Now, Senator, at church yesterday, one of my, uh, one of the, uh, my friends at church said, you know, uh, there's, a, there's ways to get to a balanced budget, and one of those is to tax the heck out of us. What's going to keep them going to a 95% uh, income tax on it so that they can balance the budget? That's certainly true, and that would be why, why I would be concerned about the balanced budget amendment that we already have on one file, minute. if that becomes the, the one that, that goes first, because um, you have to take into consideration these other issues, um, the size and scope of the federal government, the power of the federal government, and, and so on. So, you, so, so fiscal restraints, I think, is able to better handle that. So this one is not necessarily a balanced budget, but physical restraints. Fiscal restraints, correct. Okay. The other question I had was from another one person at the conversation I had yesterday said they'd gotten, they'd already gotten the robocalls that, that from, from the NRA not to support this because they're afraid that we'll lose our Second Amendment rights. Tell me about that. Yeah, it wasn't the NRA. It was the National Association of Gun Rights based out of um, Colorado. It is a group that um, spends a fair amount of time. It, 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 if there are um, Senator Chambers and I might disagree on this, but if there are um, extremist gun rights groups, um, the National Association of Gun Rights probably fits that. Time, Senators. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Hilkeman and Senator Epke. Senator McCollis, do you recognize? Uh, thank you, Mr. President. Good morning, colleagues. It is truly uh, hard to argue against the underlying proposition of this, uh, of this, of uh, this LR35. It makes a lot of sense. Uh, we can certainly say the federal government has no fiscal discipline, absolutely none. Regulatory th authority gone amok, no question about that. And the inability to deal with some of the critical issues that this country faces, like immigration, entitlement reform, and others. Those are important issues that the federal government just has not dealt with and shows an inability to uh, do its job properly. But I really wonder if this, if this uh, ailment or the cure is better than the ailment. It's, uh, what are some of the major issues connected with this, this, uh, this LR? First off, we don't know how to deal with revision or rescission. I'll read this. In March of 2014, the Georgia legislature applied for a convention to consider a uh, balanced budget uh, revoking um, a rescission of an early application in April of 2014. Tennessee took a similar action. While both applications are, villid, are valid, they revive questions as to the constitutionality of rescissions. This is something we really haven't uh, discussed and could arguably complicate uh, a uh, Article 5 convention. There's some other issues. One has to do with uh, the rules. Who would establish the rules and how would we uh, deal with those rules in any kind of constructive way? Secondly, a thre threat of a, run of a runaway convention. Those are issues that we haven't properly dealt with. And finally, I'll read uh, the uh, comments of uh, recently deceased Antonin uh, Scalia, Chief, or the Justice of the Supreme Court. And he said, for instance, Justice 
uh, recently said, I certainly would not want a constitutional convention. Whoa, who knows what would come out of it. So even this uh, baskin of conservative knowledge would not favor a con constitutional uh, convention or an Article 5 constitutional convention. So thank you, Mr. President. I yield the balance of my time. Thank you, Senator McAllister. Senator Crawford, you recognize? Question. Do I see five hands? I do see five hands. Question before you is, shall debate cease? Those in favor vote aye, opposed nay. All those voted the wish to. Please record, Mr. Clerk. 34 A's, no nays to cease debate. Debate does cease. Senator Chambers, you're recognized to close on your floor amendment 188. Thank you, Sorry, Mr. Your President. Motion. Thank you, Mr. President, members of the legislature. As I've said, I've said on occasion when I'm doing something like this, not only am I trying to kill the particular matter before us, but the underlying reason for that is to facilitate the process of legislating. We can either get rid of this now or we can carry it on. This will be like one of those test or sample votes that I always mention. If we cannot get any of the motions or the amendments that I will offer adopted, then I will take the six hours. People always will say that when I make a comment like that, I'm threatening. But how about the other side which says, we will stay here as long as we need to, we will do whatever we have to do to get our way. That's not a threat because the majority of them say it. Well, what I am saying can be construed or labeled any way somebody chooses. Time is short. But however many days we have remaining, I'm going to be here talking about something. If the body decides it will burn this day, then burn at least one more day, it plays into my hands because there are fewer days left for bad things to come before us. I think the writing should be on the wall. The discussion has pointed out many shortcomings, serious problems, grave issues that have not been resolved, even in those states where they have gone willy-nilly and helter-skelter into supporting something of this kind. I'm not going to take the full amount of my clothes, C-L-O-S-E. I will ask Mr. President for a call of the House. There has been a request to put the House under call. The question is, shall the House go under call? Those in favor vote aye, oppose nay. Please record, Mr. Clerk. 37 A's, no nays to place the House under call. The House is under call. The House uh, senators, please record your presence. Those unexcused senators outside the chamber, please return to the chamber and record your presence. All unauthorized personnel, please leave the floor. The House is under call. A roll call in regular order. Request for a roll call in regular order when we reassemble. Senators Watermeyer, Howard, Burkhar, Senator Hughes, Senator Kittner, please return to the chamber. Senator Kittner, just check in. Thank you. Senator Burke Har, please return to the chamber. The House is under call. Everyone is accounted for, Mr. Clerk. Senator Baker. Yes. Voting yes. Sir Bloomfield. Yes. 
Well, then, yes, Sir Bowles. Well, then, yes, Sir Brosh. Well, then, yes, Sir Campbell. Well, then, yes, Sir Chambers. Well, then, yes, Sir Coash. Well, then, no, Sir Cook. Well, then, yes, Sir Craighead. Well, then, no, Sir Crawford. Well, then, yes, Sir Davis. Well, then, yes, Sir Epke. Well, then, no, Sir Fox. Well, then, no, Sir Friesen. Well, then, no, Sir Garrett. Well, then, no, Sir Glore. Not voting, Sir Groney. Voting. No, Sir Kenhar. Voting yes, Sir Hadley. Voting yes, Sir Hansen. Voting yes, Sir Burkhar. Voting yes, Sir Hickelman. Voting no, Sir Howard. Voting yes, Sir Hughes. Voting no, Sir Johnson. Not voting, Sir Kittner. Voting no, Sir Kalowski. Voting yes, Sir Coulterman. Voting no, Sir Christ. Voting yes, Sir Keene. Voting no, Sir Larson. Voting no, Sir Lindstrom. What he knows, Sir McAllister. What in yes, Sir McCoy. What he knows, Sir Mello. What in yes, Sir Morfeld. What in yes, Sir Morante. Not voting, Sir Pansy Brooks. What in yes, Sir Reapy. What he knows, Sir Shear. Not voting, Sir Shields. Sir Schnorr. What he know, Sir Shoemaker. What in yes, Sir Seiler. What in yes, Sir Smith. Sir Stinner. What in yes, Sir Sullivan? What in yes, Sir Watermeyer? What in no, Sir Williams? What in yes? 25 A's, 18 A's, Mr. President, to refer the resolution to the Government Military and Veterans Affairs Committee.